Hello everybody, just really quickly before we begin, if you want to check out this video in the original way that I intended it straight from my brain, you can check it out over on Patreon. Patreon is just a way that people can support me on the channel and I can give back to them with longer form edited content that's a little bit better than what you can see here on YouTube. If you're interested in checking it out, then the link will be downstairs. As always, enjoy the video. Puss in Boots The Last Wish is everything that I love about animation and if you haven't watched it yet, go do so right now because I'm going to be getting into spoilers. Have you done that? Cool. It's no surprise to anyone on this channel that I love animation. I grew up during the Disney Renaissance and just that era of animation has heavily influenced the person that I am today. And as much as I have enjoyed the recent Disney and Pixar films, they've just felt lackluster. Movies that are churned out for the theater and streaming services as quickly as possible to make as much as possible. Am I being a cynic when I say this? Sure. But somewhere in me, there was a part of me that craved the types of movies that pushed the creativity of animation to the absolute max. And I didn't realize how much I craved it until Enter the Spider-Verse released, and then a few years later, Arcane came out, and then I realized how much I missed creative animation. It was a breath of fresh air and a stale industry, welcoming in a new wave of projects from both small and large studios alike. Showing that animation doesn't have to necessarily follow any set rules or structure so long as it's made well and made with passion. While Into the Spider-Verse and Arcane made me realize how much I missed these creatively animated movies, Puss in Boots The Last Wish has reignited my love of animation as a whole. The Last Wish is incredible. No, really. A side character from Shrek 2 got a spin-off film from Shrek in the same universe, and then that spin-off film got a sequel, and its sequel is as good if not I would contend better than the first Shrek film. This film has some of the best nuances in his character writing of recent years for both animated films and just films in general. To add on top of all of that, there is the incredible attention to detail in this movie and the fantastic visual design that pushes the medium forward. I want to touch on a few things that this film does really well in the hopes of seeing more films like this in the future. Because this film does a fantastic job of breaking away from industry cliches and expectations while still being what you would expect from a family film. Those things being the visual design and creativity, the wolf, and Puss himself. Disney has done many wonderful things over the years, but the main problem with their success is the cookie cutter visual style that has been copy and pasted between many of their films, as well as competitors looking at their success and trying to replicate it with the same visual style. Look, if I sit down to watch another trailer of another generically 3D animated feature film from a big box film company, chances are I'm not going to watch that movie. I don't care how many glowing critic reviews I read about it. I'm just not interested in seeing it. As an example, if you were to show me this, I would say it's technically fine. The animation is fluid enough, there's some nice hair physics, there's nothing here that would really pull me out of the movie except it has no soul and no identity. There is nothing here that is unique or visually interesting. Am I ragging on a Minions movie for fun? Also true. But it's the same trap that I see with Pixar. Sure, their stories are still great, but they aren't the animation boundary pushers and innovators that they once were. Again, is Strange World a fine movie with some nice storytelling and messages? Sure. But overall, it's kind of forgettable. But if I see a trailer for a film that has speed lines, comic book panel shots, visual gags popping up on screen, fights that have scratchy hand-drawn lines mixed in with fluid 3D animation, now you've got my attention. I mean, just look at it! Look at it! This! This is what I love. Not only is it visually impressive, but it's creative and it's fun to watch and look at. 
You never know what the next moment is going to bring and yet it never pulls you out of the moment. This is a film that could never work as a live action movie because the frame stretching, the character smearing, the wild camera angles, the zoom ins, this movie takes advantage of everything that animation has to offer and it's wonderful and it's technically impressive. Just look at this shot for an example of what I'm talking about here. The light is perfectly cast on right side of Pusa's body with brilliant highlighting because the sun is coming up. And you can see that light filtering through all of the individual hairs on Pusa's body and being diffused. And it's the same effect that's being used on the feather in his hat. His rapier is not perfectly shiny or matte. Instead, it's a perfect metallic reflective surface. It's imperfect. And it has imperfections and small dents and marks and scratches that all reflect the light in different ways. And all of the work for this shot that lasts one and a half seconds. That is the difference. <sighs> Look, I've said it once and I will continue to say it until the day I die. You can tell when a team works on something that they actually want to work on and are given the creative freedom to do so. Just to hammer things home even more and give you even more perspective, this film had a minuscule budget of $80 million. Compare that to the behemoth bloated budget of $180 million for Strange World, and I think you can start to understand why I'm so in love with how this movie looks. But at the end of the day, a movie's visuals only get you in the door. And as the saying goes, a movie is only as good as its villain. DreamWorks has a bit of a reputation for good villains, but this time, I think they created one of the best villains of all time, of any media, period. The wolf, or as we come to find out, death, is as breathtaking to watch as he is memorable. As I'm writing and recording this, I can still hear his lazy whistle drawing out a soft tune that should be pleasant, but somehow is so sinister and sorrowful that it makes your hair stand on end. But why is he so memorable? And why does this specific portrayal of death work so well? A good villain isn't a maniacal maniac that just does actions for the sake of doing them. Unless, you know, that's their whole character-defining trait, but even then, in those extreme cases, a truly great villain has motives and morals that guide their actions in a way that we as the audience can understand and sometimes even relate to. So how do you exactly come up with motives for death? Number one, he hates people who cheat him. You know, people who cheat death. Number two, he despises those that disregard life. And number three, he's not fond of cats. With those core tenets in place, we can start to see why he hates Poos. Poos has cheated death countless times. He's frivolously died eight times. All the while, death has had to simply look on and just watch this idiot. Well, death has had enough of the game and decides... Why don't I do us both a favor and take this last one now? He is not a malicious character, a bit sadistic to be sure, but he isn't quote unquote evil. He just simply is death. Another thing that I would say makes a memorable villain is their introduction into the story. And oh boy, I could do a full video breakdown on this one scene alone, and in fact, Many YouTubers have, but let's do the light version of that. First detail, when the doctor tells Poos that he died in the previous scene, he blows out a candle. And right before we hear that whistle, we see the last candle on the candelabra blow out, giving us a clue as to who the mysterious wolf truly is. And I love the next shot that follows it, setting up the imposing nature of death as he towers over Poos in stature, and turns the glass towards him to look at him in the reflection first before actually turning to look at him. And then he talks. And it's not what you're expecting. He sounds normal. And I know that's a funny thing to say, but 
Many interpretations of death have these crazy voice effects on it and somebody with a super deep booming voice delivering the performance, but here, he's just the guy. Albeit a guy with a beautiful voice that flows meticulously between mocking and menacing tones. Everyone thinks they'll be the one to defeat me, but no one's escaped me yet. And again, another clue as to his identity. After all of this tense setup, we get to the fight and are you kidding me? The movement is kinetic and exciting, the choreography is top notch, and they even sneak in a key detail right here. Notice the eyes being reflected in the sickles is Puss's? Remember that. And then, even the moment when Puss feels fear for the first time, that's already been set up and explained earlier on in the film. Pussy Boots has never been touched by a blade. And then this shot, are you kidding me? I'm sorry, I didn't know I was watching a horror film. <clears throat> anyway, we get these little moments of terror as death just kind of pops up in the film being his badass terrifying self. And then we get a nice reveal scene confirming that he is in fact undeath straight up. Which personally, I didn't see coming despite all of the hints and I think it's a great twist of the story. And to wrap up Death's character, we get the final fight. This scene just speaks for itself and I get giddy whenever I think about it, but I do want to point out a few things, such as Puss's one life flashing before his eyes instead of all of them all at once, callback earlier to the film just kind of brings everything full circle and leads to a great one-liner. Lives flashing before your eyes? No, just one. The subtle nod to Arrow Flynn mid-fight with the whole shadows fighting. The blade that Puss blocks in the dramatic moment of the fight is the one that has his lives counted on it. The sickle now reflects Death's eyes instead of Puss's when he turns the fight on him. The blade that falls out of his hand and Poos kicks back to him is again the one with his lives on it. There's so many small things to notice and appreciate about this fight, not even talking about the incredible animation work. From a narrative standpoint, the writers had a bit of a problem. How does one defeat death without cheating it? Enter this brilliant line. I know I can never defeat you, Lobo. I will never stop fighting for this life. Death realizes that Puss now values life and is willing to fight and cherish his last opportunity. And sticking to his motives and morals, he walks away, letting Puss live his final life, whistling his tune as he fades away, only this time, it doesn't sound so sinister. Just overall, character writing perfection. And I know what you're saying. Death isn't the antagonist of the film. Jack Horner is. And to that I say, you're right, but I don't care. Don't get me wrong. I love Jack. I think he's a hysterical villain with some of the best moments and one-liners of the movie. You're an irredeemable monster! Oh, oh, what took you so long, idiot? <laughs> but in my opinion, Death is just so much more interesting to talk about because he is the antagonist, the side character, the threat, the rival, the villain, and the friend all at once, and they just knocked it out of the park with him. Which leaves one last character I want to talk about. Puss in Boots was a character that was introduced in Shrek 2 as a side character. And when I first saw him as a kid and I saw this goofy little cat that acted like Zorro, I immediately fell in love. But after being burned out from the Shrek film's decline, when a Puss in Boots spin-off movie was announced, I just wasn't interested in the slightest. In fact, I actually rolled my eyes. How could this one-dimensional character possibly be interesting enough to carry a movie by himself as the main act? Boy, was I wrong. The premise of a cat that has nine lives that has used up all of those chances to become a living legend 
Now finally coming to terms with his own morality and experiencing fear for the first time? And instead of coming to terms with those circumstances, he runs from them and tries to solve his problems by finding a quick out. I'm sorry, I thought this was a kid's film. Puss first runs to the cat retirement home, where he loses all purpose and meaning of life. And then when he learns that the wishing star is real, he continues to run from his fear and mortality by trying to claim the wish for himself to reclaim his lost lives. Thinking that if only he had more time he could be satisfied with life, being everyone's favorite fearless hero. Then Kitty and Pero kind of throw a wrench into the story for Puss. He starts to learn the value of sharing one life rather than walking nine alone. For Puss, he starts to become indecisive of what he truly wishes for. Until our good friend the wolf keeps him on the path of terror. And this scene was the breaking point for me. Alongside Arcane, I think this is one of the best examples of what a panic attack looks and feels like. You lose the ability to think or see things rationally. Your breath gets away from you and you become isolated in your own horrifying reality. And then, to put the cherry on top of this scene, Ero comforting Puss how actual therapy dogs do by resting their head on the victim's chest to regulate their breathing and help pull them out of it? Are you kidding me? In the end, Puss realizes he doesn't need his wish, because it was a wish that he made out of fear rather than what he truly wanted. We get to follow Puss as he goes from an arrogant little legend who thought himself immortal, someone who, well, admittedly is very fun to watch, is also a massive dick to everyone around him, to someone who protects and cares those around him, someone who values life for the beautiful thing it is. Not just a legend, but a hero. Speaking of finding out that your wish has been in front of you the whole time, and you just need to shift your perspective to see it, the subplot of Goldilocks and the Three Bears crime family managed to make me cry. An orphan thinking that she just wants a normal family instead of the one she was adopted into, only to find out that they are more family than blood could ever tie by, and then this line from Mama Bear just broke me. And whether you think we're your family or not, if this is something that will make you happy, we'll get you that wish. Uh -huh. And then to balance out the very sad, serious nature of their subplot, just the idea of them being a British crime family made me cackle through the entire movie. In fact, almost all of the jokes landed for me. This felt like a return to form for the writers over at DreamWorks. The humor balanced out the inherent dark nature of the story and helped to keep the movie fresh and fun. And man! I have been quoting this movie non-stop since I first watched it. You, 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 you're not gonna shoot a puppy, are you, Jack? Yeah, in the face. Why? I will save you! Save me, oh! If it's convenient! No hablo inglés. ¿Hablas español? Yo también! Oh, ¿De dónde eres? ¿Te gustan las siestas? I don't speak Spanish either. I'm... 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 Puss in Boots The Last Wish is one of those once in every decade films that is just the embodiment of everything you love about a genre, a medium, and films in general. The creativity and the use of the medium just pushes animation towards a brighter future in the same way that Enter the Spider-Verse did. The writing is some of the best to come out of DreamWorks and I would contend that the characters here are some of their best work yet. Actually, no, some of the best, most memorable characters written, period. I really hope that this movie is a slap in the face to other companies, and it's a wake-up call. With this film releasing and seeing success alongside other incredible projects like Pinocchio, Arcane, Over the Garden Wall, and many, many more incredible animated films, I hope that this is the wake-up call that mediocre is not okay anymore. And from that, I hope to see even more projects that continue to push this medium that I love even further. 
Until that happens, though, Puss in Boots The Last Wish stands as a shining example of the best that the medium has to offer. And it's a film that I will watch and continue to rewatch over and over again. Each time being reminded why I love animation just so damn much. Special thank you to Ian Etzep and Joshua Paletti, who both are pledged at the executive level on Patreon to help make this video possible. Again, if you guys want to check out the Patreon, the link will be downstairs.